Has porn impacted your life and your relationships? Do you know someone who's been impacted by porn? You can begin the journey to freedom today and have peace of mind knowing that you're not alone in the fight. That's how Covenant Eyes works, through biblical accountability. When you sign up, you choose an ally to receive your device reports and walk with you towards a life free from porn and the life that God desires for you. If you're not struggling with porn, consider stepping forward to be an ally for a friend or a family member. Try it free for 30 days by visiting www.covenanteyes.com and enter promo code TRL at checkout. That's www.covenanteyes.com, promo code TRL at checkout. Freedom begins today. The other side of the road is safe, where we sidestep being bothered and avoid getting involved. But rolling up your sleeves and boldly going where few dare to tread, that's walking through Samaria. Each week on our podcast, we introduce you to the special few who walk in the spirit of the Good Samaritan. On behalf of The Giving Company and your hosts, David Hendrickson and Dan Riveros, welcome to the Walking Through Samaria podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Walking Through Samaria podcast. I'm your host, Dan Riveros, with my co-host. David Hendrickson. How's it going, man? Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. You ready for the weekend? It's Friday afternoon. I am ready for the weekend. It couldn't have came any sooner. Yeah? Yeah. Awesome. For sure. So we've had some husband and wife combos on this podcast, but I don't know that we've ever had father-son, right? I don't think so. I don't think we have. No. I don't think we have. No, we have not. So to our listeners, you may remember the voice of Link Forrester from a couple weeks back. His son, Cole Forrester's in the house. Welcome. Hey. Thank y'all for having me. How are you? And- like his dad, Link, he's local. Yep. So a short drive up 400 to come hang out with us on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Yeah, I love it. Awesome. It's like uh, Fort Knox getting in here, though, so <laughs> you have some good security. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Thanks to our landlord, Jackson Healthcare, for providing the, the security guards and traffic monitors and whatever else whatever else they have. So Cole, it is great to see you. I saw you gosh, a couple weeks ago at mm-hmm. your dad's book launch for the side road and got to learn frankly a little bit more about what you have been up to through that that book launch event. We're going to dive into a, a pretty tough topic today. So one thanks for kind of what you're doing in yeah. society and in the kingdom around this particular topic. And two, thanks for doing it on short notice and coming our way. And we're going to have a lot of fun this afternoon. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm excited. It's something that my wife and I are passionate about. And um, within the work that my dad and I do, uh, I just really enjoy this conversation with others. Yeah, um, it's great. So I'm excited to dive cool. in. Well, I'm going to read your bio so our listeners can learn a little bit more, more about you and your wife, Kayla. And <laughs> And then we're going to dive in, Dan, I guess, to all of our listeners. We're going to hit the topic of pornography, and um, it's going to be a productive conversation. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a constructive conversation. It's not going to be a raunchy conversation, and you all should should lean in because this is a big deal. That's probably one of the things that I've learned as I've gotten to know you a little bit more and your organization. So here we go. Cole Forrester is the son of previous Walking Through Samaria guest, Link Forrester, he hails from Roswell, Georgia. He's married to wife Kayla and works in the financial planning industry. He is passionate about true radical love from his own personal journey from pornography to a Christ-centered life. He enjoys board sports, golf, and rock climbing. Cole and his wife Kayla founded True Radical Love in May of 2020 to help individuals in their quest in true love and battling against pornography. The need increased when COVID created isolation and the solution was in connection. TRL is an online community to share the truth of the pornography industry and the real stories of those affected by it and their redemption. Their mission is to end pornography one heart at a time, because if if this evil will always exist, then the only way to win is to win the individual's heart. Cole Forrester, again, welcome to the Walking Through Samaria podcast. All right. Thank you. Awesome. (laughs) Well, Dan, we're going to do it again. Sorry. We do it every time. We're going to start with college football. Got to. All right. So... I have to think about all the Auburn fans that have been on this podcast. Link Forrester, Tally Mollering, Philip Langford, Terry Johnson, Ray Norman. There has to be more. But we have had a lot of Auburn fans on this podcast. And I would imagine, Cole, like, 
like you're okay with Auburn, right? I would think maybe, but you attended Florida State University, yeah, and their latest national championship was against Auburn. Yeah, in fact, was, they were uh, down in the game early yeah. <laughs> quite a bit. So, how did that go down? You know, with your dad, Link, and other Auburn fans when Florida State won it all. Well, we were at the game. Oh, and, uh, nice. Yes, yeah. Nice. So, um, where was that one? Where that was, was that? in Pasadena. Okay, and it was beautiful. I remember seeing the, you know, just a skyline <laughs> and amazing uh, stadium. And uh, I was set. We obviously, you know, my dad sponsored the event, which was so amazing. So I thank him <laughs> for that. But if you're the one Florida State fan, you and we get the Auburn tickets. I'm the one garnet and gold. Surrounded by blue surrounded and orange. By, yeah, <laughs> there you blue go. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, we were having a big year. So as any kid in college, I was all excited, and I probably wasn't making too many friends around me. Uh, but it was looking bad, and uh, yeah, at the end, you know, Calvin Benjamin and just that touchdown, that was it, that drive, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, but it was very quiet uh, on the way home, <laughs> not from me, but from the family. Uh, but I will say, not to burst your bubble, though, I would probably more identify as a Auburn fan. Um, I love Florida State, yeah, but I've always loved Auburn, yeah. And if it weren't grew for, up in an Auburn yeah. household. Yeah. yeah, and if it yeah. weren't for out-of-state tuition and, you know, just how crazy that could be, I probably would have went to Auburn. Yeah. Uh, but Florida State had a go to Europe for the first year of college and we'll give you in-state tuition. I was like, that's a, Done deal. That's a good deal. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. Where'd you go? Well, I was in Spain for eight months okay. and then Florence, Italy for four. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. Well, I'm not sure where we're going to categorize Cole then. And he might, it sounds like he's another one in the long line yeah. of Auburn fans that have been on this podcast. It's been tough. Dad. Adam said the list. <laughs> well, hey, first of all, or, or again, thanks for coming on to talk about, you know, it's probably something we should talk about more frequently, right? Yeah. But it's, it's a quiet topic. It's mm-hmm. a sensitive topic. It's one that doesn't make its way around dinner tables, I would imagine, very often around the country. You, you know, you have a bit of a story, you have a bit of a journey, and I think the True Radical Love website mentions that you had exposure to pornography at a relatively young age. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit kind of how that went down and, you know, what was your journey, what was your journey to redemption, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I think um, as any young boy, you're curious about the opposite sex, and um there's probably a joy and beauty to that as we think about, you know, especially as Kayla and I are about to become parents, to think about how we're going to raise our son. Yeah. And so even within all that you can do as a parent, it's just it's almost the point that our children will be exposed at some point, whether they look at it or someone shows it to them. And so it's really, I guess a lot of this podcast today could talk about some good uh, insights for parents and how to you know, create the environment for their children. Uh, but for me, I was you know, in the neighborhood and um, you know had a good neighborhood friend. And when I remember us first, you know, I mean, first experiencing maybe let's just say naked pictures that you know uh, were shown to me. We were uh, at his house, and his mom left to pick something up in a hurry, and she was gone for thirty minutes. And we're at the house bar. That's all you need. Yeah, that's all you need. Thirty well, minutes. We yeah. might, back then <laughs> when it's dial up and you know the phone wouldn't work when oh, you're on the internet. Gotcha. Like okay. it, it took a lot longer. But I, we knew we were doing something wrong, and mm. we didn't know what to do. Right? I mean, it's actually a joy of the kind of innocence that children do have, and to then kind of navigate that. So we knew that what we we're doing was probably wrong. Um, but that that was probably the earliest memory. I was probably. 10 years old or so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but even then, I would I would challenge to say that that's still very different than what our kids are going to be exposed to. Because for us, that was a, it took us 30 minutes to pull up one, you know, still image on a computer. Where nowadays, it's still around 10 that most kids are being first exposed. Wow. But now it's this endless sea of pornography from, you know, companies like Pornhub, and it's just you'd be shocked at the amount of content uh, that's on there. Gotcha. Wow. Wow. So it, it's interesting because my generation, you know, it was print. Yeah. Right? Like there was no 
anything on the internet. And it's a completely, completely different deal today. Yeah. There was a barrier to entry. I mean, you had to yeah, go somewhere. Right. That's right. You had a, you know, they were to maybe back, maybe back then they were not, but they're covered up in the gas station or, that's or right. you got to go yeah, yeah, to yeah. the actual store. Uh, you got to buy it. Uh, you got to show ID. Right. Right. Um, there's none of that anymore. Yeah. There's no authentication of the, of the user and there's no authentication of who's in that video, which is yeah. almost the bigger issue within right. it as well. Wow. Um, but yeah, that was an early story. And then kind of just really the progression, just to share briefly of where the issue expands is that, um, you know, when you're young, you're kind of maybe seeing things that are wrong. I, I wasn't really going towards pornography websites. I'm not, I knew what those were back when maybe they weren't even as popular back then. Um, but then when, you know, the smartphones came out and then when um, pornography took on more of the YouTube model where people can upload things versus it all being, you know, I don't even want to say the word regulated. It's not that regulated, but let's yeah. just say casted. Okay. Um, you know, then when I was in high school, I, I was looking at it, but I knew it was wrong. I was seeing more of hardcore pornography from the popular websites and, uh, but I was at my parents' house, so I'd hide it, you know, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then I even remember one time there was a, a block on my phone. I literally knew like, oh my gosh, like my parents know what I've been looking at. Uh, and, uh, and again, you know, in that day and age, I mean, I could, um, I could understand where my parents come from where it's really hard to talk about it. And that, that is maybe a lesson, uh, not from what my parents taught me, but, that I wish that they almost did talk to me about it yeah. versus not. Yeah. You know, after they found out, even though that would be it's very awkward and hard, yeah. Yeah. it's to be – because that, that then told me, oh, my gosh, mm-hmm. they know I'm looking at this, but they don't even know how to talk uh, to me about it. I have shame about it, but I have nowhere to let this shame go. And uh, and then when I went to college, um, or even when I went to Europe and I was traveling abroad and I went to college, I had freedom. Mm. And freedom was where this sin really took over. And I would spend a lot of time looking at pornography. Uh, I can remember in college, I mean, almost every night, you know, and sometimes it'd be hours a night. And uh, I just felt hopeless. And, you know, it's not like I had friends and, you know, would do social things, but it really made me less social. Mm-hmm. And uh, it got me into bad relationships. And then, yeah, just I just kind of had a, you know, come home moment, come to Jesus moment of just like, this is just, not where I want to be. Wow. Um, Truly a come to Jesus moment. Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> talk, talk a little bit about kind of how faith was part of your journey out of the, the state of pornography. Yeah. And that's, um, that's a very fun direction. I think we're looking at is, is from the experiences I've heard from a lot of people I've talked to is that uh, I wonder how much of the joy of Christ have been stolen from our children because of pornography. Mm. I mean, that is, is a, it's a pretty monumental thing that we don't talk about secretive, but it is a lot, and that takes over. Meaning the further and further I was falling down that path, the further and further I was falling away from Christ. It yeah. was really hard to have yeah. both of the same It's a one-to-one deal, right? Like mm-hmm. the distance grows. Yeah, and then really I think one, you know, one thing we want to talk about is why is it radical, and that's just you know, really the change is radical is quick. I mean— mm-hmm. All I had to take was for me to decide yeah, this is good. enough. Yeah. And I remember I was, it was like, <laughs> I was on the toilet using the bathroom, scrolling through Facebook like we probably all do. And my friend posted one article and it said, you know, this is how pornography is linked to trafficking. Wow. And I spent five minutes, read that article. And after that moment, now I know. So now I have to consciously decide to keep supporting one of the most evil, disgusting things that. Uh, breaks my heart to see this happening in this world, and here I am supporting it. Either I do that, or I love Jesus and and walk the way I want to live. Good for you. Um, That's awesome. Good story. True radical love. We're going to talk, you know, a, a little bit more about it. You know, more more deeper, kind of the approach, the issues, th- those kinds of things, the strategy that true radical love's involved with. But what what I've can tell from you and Kayla and the the research that I've done about true radical love is the the stance has to be strong and mm-hmm. powerful. Like you all are taking an aggressive stance against pornography. You're wearing a t-shirt right now. Yeah. <laughs> defund porn, defund sex, sex trafficking. T- 
Tell me why that's a requirement. Like, why is it so important that the stance against pornography not be one of kind of enablement or it's not a big deal? Or I think your website says every every guy does it or something like that, right? Like this, the position has to be aggressive and strong against porn. Yeah, I mean, I think a few things, and I want to be careful using this as a motivation, but there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a pride I had to establish around it where early in, I remember I was thinking, you know what? Like I, I took stock as a guy thinking, okay, who am I? Like, okay, how's my faith? You know, how's my business? How my finances? I thought, you know, if all these, if my business and finances, like if I'm not the top 1% of dudes my age, like that's okay. But you know, one thing I know I could be control of is I could be at least that 1% of guy that doesn't look at pornography. Like, could I do that? Gotcha. It's kind of like wow. when you have a, you know, the wheel of life, all the different things you can improve in. It's like, if I can improve this one thing, mm. at least could I do that? Um, and so I was just kind of a radical, you know, focus. And I think for a lot of people to realize that it's not, um, you know, pornography is the hardcore drug of lust. You know, it's not, um, it's not like, oh, like my husband or my boyfriend, he just, he just has a little issue here. It's not, you know, it's, it is pretty intense of what is being exposed and it will, it will ruin the relationship. It will ruin the marriage. Wow. You know, they can't, they both can't exist at the same time. Mm. I think really the idea for the people that we work with is to always chase the optimal direction, you know, where we truly want to go, not split hairs on, you know, the lesser of evils or what we have to do or how we have to justify our addictions to yeah. something. Yeah. It's good. You know, if if you're okay talking about it, Cole, we we had a great conversation with your dad, Link, on this podcast about his book. And one of the things that's been a part of my and Link's journey, you know, is is his situation with the loss of your brother. Mm-hmm. I don't know timing wise, kind of where that may have fit in, and kind of your journey of faith, and you know, kind of making some changes, but losing a brother is a really significant experience. Did it, how, how did that shape your journey? How did, how does that shape your faith as you kind of look back on that now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a big part and big time in my life. It was when I was 18. So it was a pretty, I guess, inflection point of uh, any young man. And um, yeah, we were devastated and it, kind of shocked our world and yeah. um you know I I I, di- I did remember I wrote this down that um a big I guess I think a big issue that came from that was I I felt that I wanted to then find happiness like you know after that hurt of my brother passing I was like I just I really just want to be happy I would say that like mm. that's my goal is to be happy yeah and if you meet people that have that goal that it's actually really hard to find, right? It's hard to find happiness because that seems situational. It's temporal. Mm. Um, but what has changed now is that it's really finding joy, you know, to be joyful in this life. Um, and I share that because from the passing of Tyler, I did live probably more of a hedonistic life of wanting pleasure. And that's sure. what yeah. this sin and lust and direction <clears throat> led to. And within the good of how God created me. I also had this part of me that, uh, was, you know, addicted to this sin. And so even when I was studying abroad, I mean, I, I just remember the great relationships I had, but then also the, the way the sin affected me when it came to wanting pleasure and not, uh, not true joy. Yeah. That's good. So let's talk about Kayla. So you all are partners in marriage, but also with true radical love. How did you meet Kayla and, I think early on in your relationship with her, or you kind of mm-hmm. made it clear, look, I'm in the 1%. I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not going to live a life dealing with pornography. Just talk about your guys' history a little bit. Yeah. And that conversation she brought up. So, but I will <laughs> give a tip to say, imagine yeah. to the audience, imagine, uh, and I share this guys, your future spouse or whoever you want to spend your life with, imagine them asking you this question, you know, do you show, or how do you feel about pornography? Or even how do you feel about your past? I mean, the past you'll explain to your future spouse is what you're currently living today. 
I share that with some guys that go through maybe hard breakups or, and then they don't know what direction I want to go in the dating world. And I want them to have a perspective of, can I establish myself as a man and use this time to grow mm. so that when my future wife asks me, you know, like I'm preparing myself for her, the person that God is preparing for me. You're kind of trusting that stewardship in the relationship that he's bringing you all together. So for us, I, um, I just moved back to Atlanta. Um, I ran a, a business down in Florida and uh, I ran it to the ground. <laughs> the business failed. <laughs> you ran it nonetheless. Uh, you could have. Yes. You could have left it at that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's good to be true to it. And um, and at the time, my girlfriend was in the business as well. And not only was mine struggling, but hers was struggling. But she was also struggling personally. And it was just a very uh, hard situation to be in. Mm. And I remember just kind of coming down to my knees, being like, "I need to come home. I need to." close us down and you'd be in your family. That's why I would say that I feel a lot of my life would resemble the prodigal son from yeah. when Tyler passed. I, I fled. I went to Europe for a year and um, I left some of the pain that was within the family. Um, and then even after I came back, I wanted to live in Florida for the next three or four years. Yeah. Um, and then when it came to me having not two nickels rubbed together and, uh, you know, having a failed relationship, failed business, you know, I came home and my dad accepted me and loved me. And, mm. um, and so that was a joy was to come back home. And then I was looking for a new career. I joined my dad's business and, um, I thought I was going to put the horse blinders on, you know, just focus right ahead on Heads business. Down. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and God <laughs> has another plan. He puts this beautiful woman, um, at the front desk and, um, she had a big crush on me That's and crazy. all of her oh friends knew and I wasn't <laughs> trying to look around, but our company at the time, we'd have all these staff events where we'd hang out together outside of work. Yeah. And so we spent some time together and we really uh, had a liking for each other. And, uh, but quickly on how this conversation happened was we both had really long-term bad relationships. So getting into this one, and us working together, we had to be serious, you know, because this is a, a big deal. I'm not, you know, for, I think most companies aren't not for casual relationships being formed and not being uh, stewarded or being cherished well. And so instead of us creating this, I guess sometimes you might create this facade of what I want that person to think about me, mm. uh, especially in early dating and courting. It's like we try so hard for them to like us. So instead of going that route, we just really got real right away. Yeah. And I kind of told her about my story, um, you know, about my history, you know, the work and all that. Um, and then we talked about, and I think that's important. That was some of the notes to go over today is that we had to define what is a relationship. What does that really mean for us? Yeah. I think nowadays that word, I mean, even like, hey, she's my girlfriend. This is my boyfriend. The possessiveness of how we feel relationships are, or how we define it. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means we love each other. That means uh, sometimes what it means now is that we do things that married couples do, uh, which I think is what we wanted to resist. Mm. Uh, because in our last relationships, um, you know, for me, it was a pseudo marriage and it wasn't honored by God. And that's where a lot of struggle was. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that kind of links to uh, Ben Stewart's book, Single uh, Engaged, Single Dating Engaged Married. Uh, great book. We read that together. Mm. And uh, from that book, we, took notes and we talk about them. That's like putting a marriage counselor right in the room with y'all. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And uh, so that really allowed us to peel back what a lot of people see in the culture of relationship, which is the physical things that people see. And we wanted to figure out what's the emotional, spiritual things. Um, what are the things we value? Wow. And some important ones for us were our faith yep. um, or our family, uh, was fitness, Still is fitness, but back then we were doing yoga every morning That's at 5 a.m. Awesome. Wow. Uh, yeah. I was as skinny as ever. <laughs> not, not that much anymore. And then friends. Yeah. Um, and those are values we really aligned on. And um, and how that conversation of pornography came up was, um, you know, I remember we are just talk in the book, it talked a little bit about it. And when she asked me, hey, how do you feel about pornography? It was fun for me to be like, oh my gosh, like I hate it. Like I was like, I don't, like I, 
I guess we never talked about that before, but I was like, I really stand against it. It's something that affected me yeah. greatly, and I just hate what it does to to me, to what it did to me and to other men in this world. Mm. And uh, instantly after I shared that with her, she, in her mind, thought, wow, uh, I'm dating a liar. Like, this guy is oh, lying really? to me. Yeah. Which uh, it's funny, and it's sad to think that right. every guy in her past, and that's what she said, she said every relationship before— um, every guy said that everyone does it. And uh, I wonder if that's what the daughters of our mm. next generation are growing up to believe, that the man that they will settle with will be addicted to pornography and there's nothing they could do about it. And it's kind of sad to think about it, Yeah, of that extremity. Wow. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of the damage, right? So I read that Kayla went to a passion conference we just mm-hmm. had brian frazier on our podcast mm-hmm. he oh, cool. went to a passion conference way back in the 90s ben stewart of course is from passion as as you mentioned he leads passion washington dc we've had a few you know a number of other passion people one of the things that the passion Con- passion conference is definitely about enabling college kids you know to grow in their faith and live out their faith during those mm-hmm. really formative years but it is a big supporter of the end it movement mm-hmm. and I think when we're when we're all at conference, you know, the X's go on our hands and, and this becomes a message. I think that was Kayla's experience at the Passion Conference, at least from what I read, that she learned about sex slavery, sex trafficking. Atlanta, unfortunately, Dan, you and I have talked about this before, tends to be a bit of a hub for mm-hmm. really bad, you know, action in those areas. Is there a correlation between those two things? Like if we talk about the damage that pornography causes, does it go to the extent of potentially contributing to things like sex slavery and sex trafficking? Yeah, it's a great question. Because, again, that's that article I read that first really exposed me to, um, I guess, instead of being a victim of the addiction, I wanted to be a person, a part of the cause. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit of our aim is not just take people away from pornography, but to take them in advocation against it and for, you know, true radical love. And that's why we're bold. That's why, you know, yeah, this T-shirt, you might have to pay money to, or it costs to buy it, but there's a cost to wear it. Because when you wear the shirt, people will ask you about it. Uh, and and that's, it takes it from an accountability of just, you know, okay, me, my, the people, my the guys around me that know about this are helping me. And then I want to be accountable to the whole world. I want people to ask me about my story. Mm. Um, when it comes to sex trafficking, there are a few ways to look at it. The The greatest, um, the most overarching one is that porn fuels the demand for uh, trafficking, meaning it's a progressional sin or issue. Uh, like my story, it started off, you know, whenever I was in secret, I could look at it. When I was in college, I could look at whenever. And then when I was in the professional world, I would— you know, use my resources towards where my heart was going. I think people say that um, where your heart or where your money is, your heart is also. Yeah, that's right. The pornography, I feel like it's backwards. It's your heart is being established in this sin. Mm. And then when boys become men or children go into adulthood, um, their money starts falling where their heart is. Mm. And so um, meaning most people are probably seeking uh, prostitution or trafficked women uh, I would be shocked if they don't have a porn issue. Got it. It's usually an underlying thing, or yeah. even the instance here in Atlanta, where the spa shooter, um, you know, shot up the or yeah, we shot up the spas. Um, that guy had an underlying issue that was not being treated, and he pornography allowed him or changed his mind to objectify others, not see them as people, and he could only take out violence on it. Wow. So part of what we want to do is, is to equip people, the churches, the schools, uh, to really not fail them in this area. Yeah. Um, and so other areas, um, let's say maybe the extreme trafficking that people think about, um, where it's maybe overseas or, kid, or kidnappings, um, especially if it's of young children, the way they educate the kids and what they'll be doing is through you know, uh, satanic things, but it also is through pornography Jeez. as well. Um, a lot more in the intra-family trafficking. It's, I don't know the exact stat, yeah. uh, but I'm sure some of your partners know it, but it's shocking how much of trafficked individuals are not the extreme form we're thinking of. 
it's either intra-family or people close to that uh, child, gotcha. uh, whether it might be an older person in the neighborhood, uh, someone in the family, sometimes parents are trafficking their children, mm. um, and how they coerce and um, how they, I guess, damage them is through pornography at very young ages. That's the first step into uh, um, coercing someone into trafficking. That's just evil, right? Yeah. You mentioned a, a couple of our partners, you know, Dan, we work with Bark Technologies mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. in Atlanta. We work with Covenant Eyes. I think they're out of Michigan. I think they're partners mm-hmm. of yours as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it, it is, it's great as giving company, Dan, you know, to have some friends who are in the middle of this, you know, trying yeah. to, trying to come up with solutions. I want to talk specifically about the true radical love approach, but before we do, I, I just want to ask one more question scary question, right? Which is, I think your website says this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And then the other thing that I read that completely freaked me out because we're in the technology business, Dan, is you say some of the world's best artificial intelligence engineers, software developers are in the porn industry. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all of a sudden this becomes really scary as far as how easy this can be accessed and how quickly you can be tripped up. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say that right now we are seeing a historical moment in the anti-porn direction okay. with, with other partners like um, what Layla Mikowat does at um, Exodus Cry. They're very legislative against Pornhub. Uh, and right okay. now they're, I mean, they're in slammed with many lawsuits and uh, things hitting them. Um, we have people like Fight the New Drug uh, in the fight. And then um, probably the biggest one is, uh, or the overarching one would be the Nicosi National Center of Sexual Exploitation. Mm. They put on a really great conference every year. Um, but yeah, it's a massive industry. Um, they hire the best from the top tech companies. And Jeez. they are creating, in a bad way, a good product. And that's an important thing to realize is that they're good at what they do. And it gives a little bit of... Um, I guess it might share a little grace to those that do struggle to say that they have people that want you to watch more and more pornography. Right. That's their job. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like if you watch. Have you seen the social? Uh, it's called the social, social dilemma. Dilemma, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So you can have watch you seen that. Yeah, it is scary. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, you could watch that again, and every time they say Facebook, you could replace that with Pornhub. And I'd say all that is true. Wow. Even scarier. Yeah. Imagine the influence that Facebook wants to have on you. Now imagine what, you know, Pornhub wants to have on you. So MindGeek is the uh, the parent company of, I would say most, I couldn't, I don't know the exact percentage, but most of the pornography that's out there. It's one uh, major monopoly and company. Okay. They own Pornhub. They own all these other subsidiaries mm-hmm. as well. Um, a, cra- a crazy stat, I remember seeing this. It, it blew my mind. I thought it was an error. Um, but there are... I, think, I believe 20,000 moderators on YouTube. Uh, there are 15,000 moderators on uh, Facebook. How many moderators do you think are on Pornhub that check uploaded videos, et cetera? Very few. At 20. Yeah. Wow. And they have more uploads than you, you know, almost any of those sites combined of the content coming up. Oh, my God. They're all English moderators, meaning even the things from other countries – they can't even moderate or or prevent going on. Wow. The moderator job, it seems like a hell in itself. Uh, there are testimonies from those that had to take breaks. I mean, it was just damaging them to, you know, hours on day be moderating pornography. Um, so it's, it's quite insane uh, just how much happens there and what's going on. And uh, hopefully there's a way that legally that can – be shut down. And I think Visa just re- Visa and MasterCard have recently pulled the ability for them to accept payroll. Okay. So they are being tightened around the neck financially. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. But our stance is that, you know, some there is going to be this depravity of the heart that will always exist in us. So we always want to take a personal approach with the assumption that if pornography is always around us, yeah. the only way to end it is when the person says that I don't want it anymore. It. Then they won't choose to look at it. Yeah, that's cool. So at some point, you and Kayla decide we're gonna get, we're gonna do something here. We're gonna found 
true radical love. Like we're going to get in the middle of this. What would, what was really the prompting that caused you all to make that decision? Yeah. Um, it was really 2020 came around. Um, and this has already been a passion of mine, passion of Kayla's was from yeah. the end it movement. The fact she went to study criminal law and justice after, um, or throughout college, uh, with that in mind, wanting to potentially be someone that would, if someone was busting in to save trafficked girls, that they a lot of times want a female representation there to help uh, right. calm yeah, the women. Exactly. Um, luckily, she's not doing that. That would be a <laughs> scary job. <laughs> but she would do it very yeah. well. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry. I just went on a re- tangent there. <laughs> Bring me back. What's the— Just uh, prompting. When When did you guys decide? Yes. You said 2020. Like, yeah. we're going to do this. So 2020, uh, business slowed down a little bit. We're still, you know, trying to push the boulder up the hill during a hard time. Yep. Uh, yet there is an influx with this itch issue. Um, typically, whenever economic decline happens or, you know, something like what we experienced in 2020, the a few industries that don't suffer would be vices, right? You know, liquor sales didn't go down. Right. Tobacco sales didn't go down. Yep. Uh, and porn sales did not go down. In fact, porn traffic went way up through the roof. Just the the amount that people are now watching it because now we're isolated. Now we're away from others. I think that's where the sin really thrives is in the darkness. It's where the is where Satan thrives is in the darkness. And when we shine light on it, when we can hear other stories and talk about it openly, yeah. that's when the power is uh, is less. Um, so our Aim was quite simple. Um, one is just like us mentioning these partners. We just really want to be a megaphone. Okay, I mean like everything I know, anyone else can know because it's just a personal journey that I took. When I realized that I wanted to be away from this, I needed to stack the facts against pornography. Because mm-hmm. if I don't stack it against pornography, I will justify why I should watch it. We are all the greatest uh, salesmen to ourselves, yeah. right? Yeah. If we want something. We'll, set, we'll justify ourselves on why we should get it or do it. Mm. So I had to then create a disdain for what it truly is and, and then create the compelling direction where I really wanted to go. And so from that, we want to be a megaphone for all the partners that, again, I just was checking out their stuff, looking at the facts, and it just created this armor around me of gotcha. why I really yeah. don't like what this is doing. Um, things like OnlyFans came around. That was quite scary where um, you see in cultures this justification of like trying to normalize things that aren't supposed to be normal. Um, And OnlyFans is a very good example of that, of trying to make pornography be this entrepreneurial women's empowerment thing, Mm. but it isn't. And it's uh, um, and it's really wrong. I mean, the guy that the guy that started OnlyFans because they say, oh, it's not just pornography, it's. It's a lot of things. You know, there's workout videos. There's cooking stuff. The guy who started it made his claim and um, bond fetish sites that people can request a certain porn that they wanted and would pay him for. So he, he is always, I forget his name, but this Russian guy, he's always been in the business of pornography. And now he creates this platform to entice others. And when economic disparity is high, when people can't, you know, they're worried about their money, uh, a lot of times they can slip into these vices. Yeah. You know, some of the porn stories um, or actors came from the, like, writer strike in Hollywood. These starving actors in Hollywood can't find anything, and uh, that's when the pornography industry is like to recruit mm-hmm. and bring them in. Mm-hmm. So it's very, uh, and that's another area back to the trafficking, is that we have this very clear example of what trafficking is, and then you start realizing really what coercion is. And you realize those that let's say let's say let's take a very gray area. Those that consent to do pornography. How about the most famous porn stars? Well, is that okay? Well, you know, once we look into those facts, I mean, mo- a lot of those women and and even men have been sexually abused at young ages. Right. In fact, said so like eighty two percent of those in let's say prostitution have been uh, physically or sexually abused at a young age mm-hmm. by at least four perpetrators on average. Oh my gosh. So there's a, there is an issue behind the issue. There's a reason why people are going into pornography is either for financial reasons. It's some of them have drug addiction, so they're preying on those that um, have addiction. It's really preying on the vulnerable, and that's how they recruit people to to do it. Mm. Um, so that's kind. Of, and then and then we just saw things like even on Netflix shows. Like I remember we were watching this one investigative series, and we were liking these shows. 
And on one of them, they have a um, they have a sex scene in the show, and it's and it's obviously legal wise, all the actresses and actors are above eighteen, but they portray a middle school sex scene or like a young oh, person. God. I'm thinking, regardless of the legality of it, the what is it doing to the consumer? I mean, people are watching this, and they are trying to portray a uh, illegal act <laughs> right. between two right. people. And uh, that's where it's just kind of like it's everywhere, you know. And it's not just now that sex sells, quote unquote. It's now ch- younger child sex sells, and they sexualize, you know, the most vulnerable. And even I think also the show Cuties came out um, on Netflix, yeah. and that was horrific. Yeah. Um, so the hard part too with what we do is sometimes research to like be understanding of what is happening, yeah. especially in the uh, CSAM, uh, child sexual abuse material mm-hmm. uh, section. Um, and a resource you can look at if you go to Nikosi's Dirty Dozen, they'll publish you know 12 companies of the year that are uh, not helping with the fight, they're adding to the issue. Right, right. And uh, you'd be shocked at what is out there. Um, even CSAM material on uh, like Amazon. I mean, it, it's disgusting so wow. Wow. I'll be careful going that direction you know there's a level of darkness of the truth that you find out that yeah. maybe helps for change yeah um, and even for us at TRL a future direction of ours once we have increased funding and have the ability to expand will be to you know delegate a, uh, a research role to someone that we feel very suited for gotcha that's good so um, I want to ask the question about you have some good stories, right? Do you have some redemption stories that, that you all have experienced? But maybe as a precursor to that, we started this conversation talking about the damage that it does. Mm-hmm. So just at its basic level, do you have a feel for what percentage of divorce or, you know, abuse is is attuned to, to pornography? And, and then, you know, since we're talking so much bad news because it's a really tough thing, I'd love to hear a couple of the of the good stories that you all have experienced. Yeah, I should have noticed some of the, the stats that really come to mind. There are a lot of stats out there, and I do want to be careful on sharing stats to then create change because I think facts are important. Yeah, and they are out there, and I find that if you're in this struggle, uh, you know, really come to truth with those facts. Um, but. Part of it's the testimony is, you know, what I would call it's like we got the head stuff, right? The facts, the mind, right, the logic. Right, right. Yep. Uh, and then you got the ethos, the emotion, the um, what really hits home. Right. Right. Because some some MD or some research person could tell me, no, there's no, you know, pornography is not an addiction. Mm. It's like, really? Because I was addicted. Right. And you can't tell me I'm not. Yeah. I wasn't addicted. <laughs> uh, there's a girl on Joe Rogan that uh, – it was a funny clip, but she tried to say that, and Joe Rogan's like, "No, I have many friends that are. You, you should tell them that because yeah, they're right. addicted." Yeah, yeah. And even the DSM five, the newest, uh, you know, what psychologists uh, use for their manual, uh, the Bible of psychology for them, so to say, um, they still did not include pornography as an addiction, mm. uh, even though they have a you know obsessive or some kind of gaming disorder, you know. If, Excessive gaming disorder. Yeah, they have right. that in there, yeah. but they don't have pornography addiction. EGD yeah, yeah. is in there, but not pornography. But not pornography. So yeah. there's this weird push to not uh, truly categorize for pornography what it, for what it is. Yeah. Um, and so through other, I mean, through stats of, um, let me see that T-shirt actually real quick. These are some of my favorites. Uh, if you look oh, at you our got T-shirt, them. There yeah. you go. On the, on the T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. I'll say part of our inspiration of our boldness would be from Fight the New Drug. They're a great friend of ours, and I would encourage anyone to look them up. Okay. Uh, they have a shirt that uh, says, Porn Kills Love. Mm. And uh, that's kind of where we got the idea. We just want it to be out there. We want people to you know, snap their necks to turn back around and be like, what's that shirt say? Yeah, yeah. And then on the back, we have the facts that can provide some – talking points or some like one of these might hit really home uh to your heart and and that's the goal it really takes one thing for your heart to say you know what i want to find the other direction and that's our goal because most people change when they hit rock bottom and so for my rock bottom was reading one article on facebook right that's a good rock bottom to have some people's rock bottom is that they're losing their family their career they're on their third divorce 
and um, that's when they want to change. So one of our aims is to put content out there, to put things out there that when someone sees it, they say, okay, now I do want to decide now. Now where do I go? Right. Um, so let's hear them. Yeah. Yeah. So 40 million Americans regularly watch porn. America is the top consumer of child pornography in the world. 35%, so a third of all internet downloads are pornography. 87% of college men and 30% of college women watch porn weekly or daily. You know, using the word regularly, sometimes it's hard to identify, but to imagine. And when I read that, it's like, yeah, that was that was me. Wow. I, I could see that to be true. Yep. Um, 50% of 11 to 13-year-old children have been exposed to porn. Uh, Pornhub has 33.5 billion visits in 2018. I think they're at 44 billion in 2021, Facebook had um, uh, two billion. They had about 24 million total. Okay. It was doubled wow. the traffic to to Facebook. Uh, 75 gigabytes of data streamed every second. So that would fill 4,200 64 gigabyte iPhones. I don't know if they make those anymore, but every <laughs> hour. So imagine having yikes. Let's say half of those 2,100 right. iPhones in a room that get filled up every hour of pornography. Uh, 12 new videos and two hours of content are uploaded every minute. Um, 88.2% of porn shows physical aggression, 94.4% directed towards women. Um, incest and teen porn are the fastest growing trends and 134 million views of deep fake pornography, uh, which I wasn't, and I didn't even know what that was. That's where, um, you know, people can create a fake video by, it's even uh, as evil as, you know, these wet, like let's say someone has a TikTok or they're following this girl that they have an obsession with or something they really like. But they could almost send that person's videos into this company and they'll create a pornography of that person. Uh, and it's devastating. And then that could be uploaded. Um, a lot of It's more in the celebrity world that people know that term. Mm. Um, but just the, the increase as technology increases, so is this evil. They've already estimated that virtual reality is going to be a multi-billion dollar revenue addition to pornography. I can't imagine the next generation that is into this meta universe, this virtual reality, right? And just the For porn, yeah, just Ugh. the exasperation of the issue from there. Yikes! Sad because so as we think of the positive direction, yeah. Technology so give can us do, some, there is the evil that follows. Exactly. Give us some good stories. Give yeah. us <laughs> take us out of this for a minute, if you don't mind. Like, where have you seen life? You know, life change happen, redemption happen. Yeah, and part of that aim of sharing those things is for the listener to say, you know what. I need to know. I need to hear these things. Yeah. I need to know the of truth. Course. Yeah, there's that level. And I could go into one of these stories where um, I'll use John for each story. But my friend John, uh, we had a retreat um, at the lake house for one of my other uh, friends that does this Christian coaching okay. uh, company. And because my dad uh, is gracious enough for them to host at the lake house, uh, they're gracious enough to let TRL have a good segment there. Uh, so about two hours, we hang out with these guys and talk about this issue. And throughout that, one of my friends, John, he just he just started bawling. I mean, he just mm. was crying. I mean, just this con- like what it is just hit his heart so strong. And uh, even the relationship we have with our family, like our like sister, and even as I relate, I remember when my sister started dating guys. I used to be so bad, big brother, right? Like, and the issue was I probably viewed every guy like the broken guy I was. But then when I started getting rid of this and seeing a better light and people, I could then start actually respecting you know others, and that's where my relationship with Caroline really grew further. So for him, Caroline Forrester, who's yeah. a Georgia grad, by the way, Dan, we bum, need bum, to. Bum. <laughs> yeah, y'all might do that. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Caroline. Uh, she knows my daughter Caroline. They're the same age. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Honestly, she would probably hate this though. <laughs> I mean, uh, she is very brilliant. You know, she wants to be in surgery. So right, uh, exactly. Um. So yeah, he just this broke his heart because he thought about his relationship with his sister and just how much pornography has vilified his thoughts mm. and. uh and so that night he made that decision, like that broken heart made that decision of like, I never want to watch this again. Yeah. And just same thing. I don't, I'm not the 1% financial club and success. But I could be that 1% guy that is protecting my heart. That's the idea. There's a greater That's issue good. than just pornography. Because sure. when you get rid of pornography, well, then you got the explicit Instagram. You got the things you're watching on Netflix. I mean, it's really a holistic approach. Your eyes have to be focused on the greatest good. Um, cause everything else wants to take that away. Yeah. And so, uh, 
So his story, he struggled with it for 13 years um, uh, daily, which I would probably say that's probably like my story. Sorry. And um, I think now he's over 200, 300 days uh, free of pornography. Yeah. And not only that, the greatest part about it is everything else that happened from that domino falling. Mm -hmm. You know, because I didn't didn't create a pipe dream saying, look, John, if you do this— you're going to meet the woman you're going to marry. Your your faith is going to grow. You know, it's not a, I didn't sell them on everything that could happen, but to see what, I guess, the beautiful work that God does in someone, when that thorn, when that sin was taken away, I mean, his faith has grown. Um, he's probably spent more time in God's word than ever before. Um, he met an amazing woman who they have a great relationship with. Uh, might get really exciting. Maybe there's some big steps happening soon. Um, to see him start this relationship with purity of eyes, purity of heart, and creating yeah. that with uh, his future spouse that he can cherish um, is quite amazing. Yeah. And that's really the perspective. Another thing for the audience when we think about relationships is that I like uh, the word stewardship, that we are, you know, we're able to steward that person, that the way right. I am with my relationship with God and my faith and who I am as a person, God is in stewarding me with the opposite, with the with the woman that he is growing in their faith. Yeah. Um, and so to see my friend John have that now is uh, quite amazing. That's awesome. Uh, I have another friend who had uh, issues in his marriage, um, had a lot of secrets for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And um, and then to see, you know, it's kind of interesting. Because I started this, I will get random calls from people. Um, and as often as I like to think, oh, man, they might want to, do some financial planning or some insurance. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Nine out of ten times, it's not that. Uh, <laughs> nine out of ten times, it's uh, hey, Cole, I need help. Yeah, you know, my relationship's falling apart. Wow. Or I just I'm broken. I just love being able to like. Uh, I think that's a gift that this has created, where I can at least hear people's stories and in a world that they have to put on their best face or best foot forward, um, they can at least just tell one person about what they're going through. Yeah. And uh, so my friend, he uh, he confessed all this to his wife. And uh, the grace that she showed is like, I mean, just see the power of Christ through our women that God pairs us with is yeah. miraculous. Yeah. And uh, the grace she gave him and the love, it, he wanted to change. Like, it's not like he wanted to change, but he thought he was going to lose everything and still need to change. But to see the gift that Christ gives mm. in a world that would say, that's ridiculous. Like, that person should leave or whatever. Right, right. But to see the the beauty of her, you know, lifting him up. Um, and, uh, yeah, he's grown a lot, too, and spending a lot of time in God's Word and to see his faith and him grow as a, as a father as well is really yeah. cool. So I want to unpack that for a minute because— I mean, there's this, you talked about the evil of it, right? Like big companies, big technology, coercion, like there's evil happening, right? Mm -hmm. So many, many people getting exposed and addicted to pornography, I got to imagine that wasn't their intent. And so along with that comes shame, guilt, isolation, right? You're... Mm -hmm you're less inclined to focus on your relationship with God. You're probably less inclined to think about other healthy relationships or serve people well or whatever it might be. I mean, the first story you told, this guy's in the middle of a group of people and they met him with grace, right? And like Mm -hmm. open arms. And the second story you told, the wife met him with grace and with open arms I just want to talk about that message to our listeners for a bit, right? Because here's the reality. The reality is probably most people that we know, more people than we think, are struggling with this. And our reaction to it is critical. Yeah. Right? Yeah, especially for spouses, too. I would say it's sometimes when I talk to men, I will um, I will sometimes encourage them not to uh, disclose everything right away, right? It could be emotionally damaging. It could be, you know, the therapy after yeah, yeah, because yeah. of the different perception of pornography for mm-hmm. others. I mean, men are very different than women uh, and how we're designed. And so, uh, but I still think it's true for a man to then be honest with another man. That's one thing. One thing is 
good. Sometimes people yeah. come to me because they got called. Like, hey, my my wife caught me looking at pornography, and I wanted to call you about it. Mm. And I'll, I'll and it's like, but how? I was like, how honest were you really with her? And typically they're not fully honest, which is okay. But you need to be honest with someone at least, like me. Like in other words, did you? Does she know how often you watch it? Does she know what you're watching? Yeah. Like think about that. Like, and what is that doing? If you don't change, what kind of man am I becoming? If I'm spending every night looking at these types of thematic pornography, that will come out to who I am. And that's why when we see people that do these things that that you know are not faithful in their marriage or that. Um, Maybe it's even a heinous sex crime of <laughs> pedophilia or something. They didn't. I don't believe that anyone woke up that day saying, "You know what? Today's the day I'm going to do this." Right. It's this slow drip of poison of pornography. Yeah. Um, so I think it is important for spouses to, um, uh, you know, it's for them to not react as emotionally and attack them as a person because you did fall in love with this person. This is the person you married. Yeah. Um, and there are. Ma- Pornography is not that person. That's something that they are struggling with. So really detaching the very powerful bad product from the person that's struggling with it is quite helpful. We had a young uh, young guy, Sanford, uh, who shared such a great quote. He said, "Like I wish, I wish parents um, treated porn like uh, like getting bit by a dog. Like my son got bit by porn. Mm. I mean, if your son gets bit by a dog, you don't yell at your son. Hey, why'd you get bit yeah, by that right, dog? Right." No, you're you're upset with the dog, you know, and then you want to protect your child. And so I think that's, that's important good. for us to be yeah. upset with the pornography industry and what it is and to and to love each other as, you know, broken, you know, individuals, that's you know, really sinful good. humans. That's really good. I um I want to ask you like some of the stories that you've shared, you know, are associated with rock bottom. Right? Mm-hmm. I I've I'm at my wits end. I got to imagine there's just tons who are experiencing the slow drip like you talked about it. Right. And, and so I want to ask you, like, are there some really practical things that couples can do? Individuals can do to turn the faucet off, you know, to kind of say, I don't necessarily have to hit rock bottom. Like I can, I can take practical steps today to get out of this and make sure it doesn't get worse. You know, I think about the, um, my kids give me a hard time, but I, the settings on Netflix yeah, and I don't know how to do this on like every, every streaming service. And I don't know how to do it on every internet browser, but I know how to do it on Safari yeah. and I know how to do it on Netflix. And I dialed it all the way back to, um, PG 13 or R I can't remember, but that was like two categories that I completely said, I just can't, str- I just can't stream in the house. Like it can you cannot be looking for it and it can still show up. So anyway, just as an example, I'm no more perfect than anybody else, but yeah, pra- practicality where our listeners could say, Hey, if I could do a couple things, I can reduce the drip or maybe actually shut the faucet off. Yeah. And I hope people are concerned about that. Right. I feel like we're almost at the point of the delusion of um, even what is on Netflix. Right. I mean, I remember growing up, we had probably stricter parental controls, even on the shows you're watching, but now with the exposure the mainstream exposure of such rampant hardcore pornography. Yeah. We've been very desensitized. Yeah. Um, so those are fun. Those are the good battles to have. Right. And that's the fun part is once you conquer, let's say hardcore pornography websites that you would normally go to, that's the battle's not over. That, it like just began, you know, cause then you start realizing all the other things I didn't notice. You know, if I was struggling with hardcore pornography on my phone at night, well, I didn't even realize what I was looking at during the day or how I was viewing others or how I was looking at my social medias mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. all the other, you know, evils that point you there. You know, people are like, I'm on my ESPN app and there's like an ad at the bottom that's triggering. It's like, it's it's crazy. Yeah. So I think a few things for parents to um, and resources is maybe to switch it from, I guess back in the day they say, uh, when you have the talk, right? It's not the talk. It's not a talk. You know, when you have children, it's a series of conversations with them about this. And you want you want to have the environment where you're the first person they'd come to. Because a lot of people might be exposed to it, right? They're at a friend's house or party, and their friend shows them pornography. Right. Well, you want your son to be comf- son or daughter to feel comfortable to come home and say, hey, this is what I saw, and to— and to listen and to not attack, not judge, and even not to attack 
the other family yet. You got to be careful. Um, but there's definitely a good way to go about it. That's very, very important. I would recommend um, my friend in this in, in this world is Emily Goudreau. Okay. Uh, she has a podcast, How to Raise a Maverick. Mm. And uh, she has a lot of, uh, you know, teaching on how to react and how to raise kids. That's good. Uh, we had her on our uh, Facebook Live once, and it was phenomenal. That's great. That's great. Um, so other resources. And like I said, I mean, the rock bottom. Um, like some testimonies, like one of my friends, we'll call him John. He's like, you know, he's like, Cole, honestly, me just giving 25 bucks a month. Like, I haven't looked at porn since I started that. And he's been involved with something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I see that, that's so, a good suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a good plot. I'm just kidding. Now. But yeah. uh, it is just the idea of sometimes a little reminder you need, a little thing that keeps you going. Yeah. Um, and that's where our post is. We're, our post on Instagram is we hope that that can create the rock bottom, right? We hope it's as simple as that. Mm. You know, I had another friend, uh, we'll call him John, <laughs> who uh, he hopped on one of our Zoom calls. And uh, he didn't say a word during the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, he left. I never saw him in another weekly Zoom call we had. Uh, and then about six months later, one of his friends was like, Cole, you need to talk to him. Like, he's like he's been talking about how he's been pornography-free for like six months. And it was crazy where he just, again, I don't know the one impact that could happen, right? Yeah. And uh, the goal is that everyone that does this is really in it together, which is a beautiful thing about yeah. this industry is that there's not – Competition. You know, we need to all forces to lock arms and uh, to help each other out. So that's why I love pointing to other companies like Covenant Eyes, Bark. Those are great environmental resources yeah. to help control the environment. As important as the environment is as protection, it's still the heart as well, which they do have great resources on there, just as I'm sharing. Uh, Fight the New Drug is great. Exodus Cry is great. Um, Your Brain on Porn by... Um, Gary Wilson, he actually passed away not too long ago, uh, but he wrote a book, and uh, that one has a lot of testimonies, mm-hmm. um, a lot of testimonies from Reddit, uh, which Reddit could be a uh, triggering place to go. It, honestly, any social media is sure going to have this, yeah. but in Reddit, there's a, a lot of people that post anonymously about their issues mm-hmm. with pornography, and okay. so to hear the stories and the struggles they go through, um, and that was an area where we reach out to people. We message them like, hey— we love for you to meet someone and uh, share that story with you know someone over Zoom or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then the women's perspective was powerful too. To hear how the women felt about their spouse or themselves that struggle with pornography mm-hmm. uh, was shocking too. I think it really come to that realization of like this is a true feeling that she has with the person that she loves, and it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's heartbreaking to see women even change their bodies to try to match pornography. Mm-hmm. You know, to have surgeries and. Um, you know, it's just sad because their heart's just crying out, you know, like, can I be enough, you know? Mm-hmm. And they're not intentionally. The guys aren't intentionally saying that to them, but that's how, you know, the women feel. Yeah, yeah. I remember this is hopefully helpful to our listeners, but way back when I had graduated from college, went to Chicago, and I was living with three other guys from Indiana University where I went for undergrad. And my friend Brent good friend Brent. I, I grew up with him. I've known him my whole life. One of my dearest friends. He had a friend, Wendy, and Wendy was a very strong believer. And she was with us one night as we were watching, not, not porn. It was like a, a movie that had evil, evil in it, like not mm-hmm. exorcist, but something like that. Yeah. And she said, you guys, you know, my parents always told me, once you see something, you can't unsee it. Uh, yeah. And I just, I've remembered that. I bet that was 30 years ago, maybe 31 years ago that she said that. And it just has served as a, a bit of an okay guardrail, you know, like, yeah, once, once you see something, it's very hard to unsee it. That's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That was good. So how can people find out about true radical love? How can people find you guys online, get involved? What direct them to TRL? Yeah, so we've updated our website. It looks pretty good, trueradicallove.org. Uh, so it needs some updating because <laughs> we are going through a little bit of a direction. So we're still a, a baby nonprofit in this cause. Um, so we're still you know, learning our feet and where we want to go. Uh, I'll say the way to really help um, is just reach out to us. I'll take a call and I'll get time with whoever. 
that's kind of where these stories are coming from is not from anything I've actually like <laughs> orchestrated through TRL or just Individual from the TRL then yeah. reaching out. Yeah. So, uh, but I do feel we will partner with my friend Ryan Stringfield at Pathways to Life. Um, they do drug preventative work in the high schools in North Fulton area. Okay. So we are going to get a little bit more local. And I I can see the – I just want to imagine the joy of helping people earlier on, right? I mean, most of the people I talk to are in their early 20s to, let's say, late 30s. Um, and that's where we get into the professional world. We start seeing this issue really come yeah. out more. Yeah. But to even catch uh, – to educate and uh, help – kids when they're younger, when this is really happening, when it's the formative years, uh, is going to be helpful. And uh, churches, you know, we want churches to have resources to talk about this. Um, and uh, we want to be similar to like a Chick-fil-A model where we we will believe in Christian values and principles in everything we do, um, yet we can be there for everyone. Like, you know, Chick-fil-A has a great chicken sandwich. Non-believers and believers go to Chick-fil-A to get their sandwich. Uh, so we need yeah. to have a good product. Our good product is the way we can help people uh, understand this issue yeah. and uh, and then also find the, the truth in God's word through it. Um, so we do want to impact the churches, help them address this issue. Uh, it's shocking if you'd imagine, you know, half the con- let's say half the congregation has this issue, but we're not directly calling it out. Right. It's shocking. Yeah. Um, and there was a stat— this one I don't promote as much because it was harder for me to verify. Some of these on this shirt, I wanted to make sure they're pretty verifiable so I didn't get much backlash. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one that back in like 2010, so that uh, 50% of pastors struggle with pornography. Mm. I mean, that's that's great. That's tough. Yeah. Because that's the per- leader on the stage. So then call something out that you're struggling with, it's probably difficult. So we want to encourage boldness. Yeah. And, uh, and Perimeter actually right now is doing a series on uh, sexuality, and what the Bible says. That's really exciting. Uh, but how they can find us is our website. I say our Instagram, probably has some really good stuff. Okay. Scroll through some of our old, um, we would have a fact and then testimony, fact and then testimony. So logic, you know, emotion, logic, emotion. Um, and, you know, just check out our partners too. Um, cause they're doing great work here. Um, but yeah, again, if y'all want to, if you need help or want to reach out, just you got to message me on Instagram. It's, on my phone, so I see it if you message. Um, I love that. Yeah, I, I, I do just, whatever. So, TrueRadicalLove.org, your Instagram is True Radical Love. Yes, is that, is true. That right? It's a little underscores between the words, okay. true underscore radical underscore love. Great. I just love that you're making yourself available for individual conversations. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so much progress that happens just one-on-one, mm-hmm. right? And Because it is something that's associated with the level of guilt and shame and hiding so yeah. I think that's awesome that you've that you've done that. Yeah, and that's kind of where we're at now. We're always it's almost uh, we're gaining the direction organization, especially with the help of Ryan and what his amazing nonprofit does. Yeah. Um, yet, um, yeah, that's the accessibility. Is I don't think we're too busy where I can't have a call. And what's exciting is I will always challenge those that go on this journey. Like my friend, that's three hundred days without pornography. It's there's a point where I challenge him to say, when are you gonna lead others. Mm. Uh, you can't Good. just hold this gift in by yourself. Yeah. And you're probably already telling people about it. It's like, yeah, yeah, well, I think eventually we'll have this direction where we'll have leaders from within that help others. That's great. So before we let you go, this is a podcast about being a good Samaritan, and, and we kind of adhere to the Luke chapter 10 principle of being a good Samaritan, which is feel comfortable reaching out and serving and loving and taking care of people that are that are going through something maybe that you haven't haven't gone through or that you've overcome, right? They're they're in a different place than than you are. That's kind of the story of the Good yeah. Samaritan, right? So just one, maybe one final piece of universal advice to all of our listeners who are, you know, Christ followers. What's what's one thing that you would kind of leave them with as a either a call to action or a bit of advice on this? you know, really tough issue called pornography. Yeah, I would, um, I would say the answer is in Christ. That's mm-hmm. kind of hard part with TRL at some point because we want to stay pretty open and be a little careful with um, it being too theological, theological yeah. right? We don't yeah. want to, but that is the answer. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the it's principles. Good. Like if you, even if you don't believe in gravity, you are affected by gravity. If, 
those that don't know Christ yet, Christ still exists. He doesn't come into existence because one decides to know him. He is he is there. Yeah. And he's always been. Um, so I, I would say that the only way to truly get past it, because ego will fail you, pride will fail you. Sometimes if you take too much pride, like, hey, I'm 300 days, 301, well, Satan's going to come after that. Mm. And when he does, let's say you're at day 389 and you fail, it's okay. Like, yeah. you're still 381. Now, even if now it's I failed once, that's okay. Like, uh, give yourself a little grace there. Pick up your cross and, and you know, carry or, or have Christ help you carry your cross That's and good. learn from every moment. Yeah, you know, A lot of it's just awareness, it's prayer. Um, and then I think one thing, especially since this affects young people, and I wish I did this more, is to really uh, enjoy uh, reading the Bible. Mm. You know, like I've read it more in the last couple of years than I did my whole life, even yeah. going to private school. But I enjoy it. Like I, I search— Try to seek all the sage wisdom, you know, all the Tony Robbins I could, hours and hours of Tony Robbins, and it's good stuff. Yet, that's not my Christ. That's not the truth. And yeah. the Bible is the ultimate authority of everything. And to really spend time in each of those, and you see these stories all throughout. I mean, you see the nature of us as um, as people, and really to dive into that. You know, I think I think another good direction is apologetics and those really hard questions. Right. Being okay with saying. I don't know these answers either. And if I don't know these answers, it doesn't mean I lack a faith, right? I mean, uh, Peter was like, you know, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's right. It's okay That's right. for us, yeah, especially yeah. for the non-believer. And he was face to face, right? Yeah. <laughs> for a Christian to be yeah. honest with the non-believer, be like, look, I struggle with this too. That's okay. I mean, we need to become relatable uh, to this world, and That's good. and we are all broken people. So I think the non-believers watch the Christians. And I think it's important for us to. Be vulnerable, be true, and then be, you know, leaders as well. Cole Forrester, thank you so much. Really tough topic, but you've you've given it kind of reality to us and, and to our listeners of how dangerous and destructive it is, and yet talked about the other side as well. And I love how we wrapped up, which is, you know, ultimately Christ is gonna be is gonna be the answer. And so yeah. thank you so much for what you and Kayla are doing. Congratulations on the pending, yeah. the pending baby boy. I guess who's yeah, on the up. way. So, <laughs> and shout out, you know, as we did before, to Covenant Eyes and Bark and other partners of yours and of ours that are really trying to help people through this mm-hmm. really really tough experience called pornography. Thanks yeah. so much for being on today. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Well, David, here we are. Yeah. And I'm your host, Dan Riveros, with my co-host David Hendrickson. And we were here with Cole. Cole, thank you so much for being on, man. (laughs) All right. That was awesome. Thank Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in, listeners. Talk to you next time. See you guys. For more content like this, visit us at givingcompany.com. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Walking Through Samaria.